All right. So let's look at a familiar example. A, couple, a few classes ago, we derived the equation of motion for the elastic deformation of a bar. And it was like this, right? And, you know, we, we, we worked it out where if, where we showed that, you know, if, if AX is equal to A0, then you get basically your, your known solution from, uh, from undergraduate mechanics where the tip, dis the end deflection is PL over AE, right? Um, but then I kind of proposed, well, what if we use some more complex shapes, then it becomes a little more difficult to solve, right? Still, you can do it, but uh, eventually, if, if the cross-section is so complex, then we have to resort to uh, discretization. So with that, and of course, this is subject to an initial displacement of zero, and force on the end of the bar. And we showed that the quadratic functional for this guy is this. So let's go ahead and work this out with our polynomial interpolating function. So we're going to assume that u is approximated by u of h, which is ci xi, or cj xj, whatever. I'm sorry. ci xi. Yeah. So what does our number of interpolating functions depend on? So how many functions interpolate? Well, okay, right now there's just one interpolating function. It's this. Right? It's just it's just how many terms are we going to take of the series? The more terms we take, the we'll approach the solution. Okay? In a minute this is sort of the last example we're going to work like this, where we're just going to sort of consider only the case of taking more interpolating functions. What we're going to do in a few minutes is then say, well, instead of just having a higher order interpolation of the solution, what if we break the body up into multiple pieces, and then we can have lower order interpolations, but many of the pieces, and so it's sort of a trade-off. So right now, we're just arbitrarily making the decision that you know, we're going to truncate this at some time, at, at some number of i. Right? And uh, so with that, um, I'll work one more example. And you know, I, like to, I like to go ahead and get in the habit of using the computer for these. For one, I don't really like doing algebra by hand because I'll make a mistake. But I mean, soon enough, we're going to encounter problems that are just too difficult to do by hand. So let's get in the habit of using the computer. All right. So for this one, I'm actually going to define a function for the area. That's AO1 minus x over 2. L. And then I'm going to define my interpolating function as u of x is the sum of c i times x the ith power, and i is going to go from 0 to 3. All 
right? So I, can, I know it's hard to see, but can everybody see? I just created a polynomial. So I have a constant C0, x times C1, x squared times C2, x cubed times C3. Right. Then I'll put that into my quadratic function. Quadratic functional. So that's going to be e over over two times u h prime over x squared minus p of x over integrate over x. All right, hang on, I think. So that's the closed form integral of that thing. It's, it's ugly but because it, it's got all those constant coefficients in it and everything. But then, so now what do we do? So we had a functional. We, we assumed a solution and plugged it in. That, then that allowed us to integrate it in closed form. Now we have a function. How do we minimize a function? Yeah, take what's partial with respect to the constants and solve for the constants, right? So, so we're just gonna, I'm gonna do that sort of all in one step here. I'm gonna take the partial of ii with respect to c0. Uh, I actually made a, one little mistake, there was I'm, tr I'm trying to go through the machinery of the process, and I sk skipped a step. The, s the step I skipped is to ensure that this interpolating poly polynomial that we assumed uh, satisfies the boundary conditions, right? So that the boundary condition is that u h of 0 has to equal 0, right? So if we plug that in, you can see that C1 equals to 0 satisfies that boundary condition. So I'm just going to do that programmatically. C0. Okay, so with that, I'm going to redefine my interpolating function to be consistent with that. So it's going to be u of x evaluated with c equals to 0. Right. So, so now the c equals, the c0 term is gone. That's all I did. Right. So that x times c1 x squared times c2, x cubed times c3. All right, now evaluate the integral. It'll be a little bit smaller, uh, shorter. OK, so now minimize it. So I take the partial with respect to c1, set that equal to 0. The partial with respect to c2, 
set that equal to zero, partial with respect to C3, set that equal to zero, solve that for C1, C2, C3. So there's my constants. So those are the constants, so then I can evaluate the solution with respect to those constants. That's, that's the approximate solution, okay? So let's just take a look here. Um, let's just plug in some numbers. So if I plug in x equal to l, l equal to 1. So basically I'm evaluating this function at the end where l is equal to 1, p is equal to 1, ao equal to 1, ey, that's the Young's modulus, equal to 1. And then I'm afraid that what I wanted to do is not going to work. Ah, I see that there's a problem. I had accidentally put this uh, P times the approximate solution inside that integral, it, it doesn't belong there. So I'm just going to reevaluate everything. All right, sorry. So that's the actual correct solution, correct approximate solution. So all I want to do is then, if, if we actually solve this analytically, we get, uh, so now I'm just going to solve the differential equation in closed form. Solve that for u of x. Then plug in if I plug in the numbers. 
same numbers. Um, ah. OK. So sorry it took so long. But you can see this is the, so I actually solved the differential equation analytically, right? And then I just plugged in the same numbers that I did, that I chose for the approximate solution. Basically, just everything's equal to 1, all the data. And I know it may be a little hard to read, but the actual solution at, the, at 1, at the end, the actual solution, the displacement is 1.38629, OK? 1.38629. And our approximate solution is 1.38624. But here, we didn't have to solve a differential equation. You know, we did, but we did it in a special way, numerically. Question? Yeah. So we never used the second boundary condition to describe this first equation? Yeah. Because when you, you said you applied the, boundary, the first boundary condition to the, to the two-plane function, the, the polynomial, at first. Yeah. But so, the OK, so in the. When I solved it analytically, the so-called strong form, you know, the equation of motion we derived, right? When I solve it analytically, I, I plug it in right there, and so it's used in the solution. Okay. If you remember, when we developed the weak form, there's something special about this boundary condition. It's called a natural boundary condition because it appears naturally in the weak form, and it's actually this term right here. See, there's a P there. That's where it comes in, right? So it's, it's naturally in the, in the weak form. So when you develop the weak form, what you'd see when you develop this quadratic functional, remember how we did that. It's a, very, it's a very systematic thing. You have the strong form. You multiply by a test function. You integrate over the body. You use integration by parts to switch the differentiation on, onto the test function, right? Well, what you would end up there with there is a term that looks like Ea because there's no P in the original differential equation, right? But there is an EA. When you work through this machinery, what you end up with is a term that's EA partial U partial X evaluated at L. It comes from that integration by parts step. But that is the boundary condition that we set that's equal to P. So we just plug it in right there. That's where it comes from. So it is in there, but it's naturally in the weak form. So that's another advantage of using the finite element method or you know, Ritz method. Finite element method is just a piecewise, uh, element by element implementation of the Ritz method. And that's one of the advantages is that the application of natural boundary conditions occurs naturally. I mean, it's, 